This has Amer Americans very worried. I mean, I hear people talking about it all the time. They want answers. One of the things that I know you have um, been wrestling with what the answer is, how is it spread? How do people catch the coronavirus? Well, I think the primary way that this is spread is from somebody who is sick and coughs and sneezes and creates these respiratory droplets that are full of virus. Someone else breathes those droplets in, and that's primarily how they get ill. But we also know that it can, it can stay on surfaces for up to days, and people can touch those surfaces and possibly uh, infect themselves. And we also know, and again, I talked to Dr. Redfield about this in detail, that even someone who's not sick, who, who has either minimal symptoms or, or no symptoms, can also shed the virus, shed the virus from their body and potentially uh, be contagious as a result of that. The primary driver is still going to be sick people, but uh, th there are these other ways that it can spread as well. How do you protect yourself? How does Allison protect herself from me? Thank you. Uh, you as I know see what she's what thinking. Goes on here as I, as I hack, breaks. you know, up my lungs during commercial break here. No. How do you protect yourself, especially if you can get it from people who aren't symptomatic? Yeah, I hope you're not truly hacking up your lungs in, in, in commercial break because if you're sick, you, you should stay home. I mean, and that's a basic rule and, and people who are healthy should a, avoid sick people. The, the, the basics apply here. You know, it, you heard Dr. Redfield say this is behaving very much like a flu virus. How do you protect yourself against the flu? Well, you have a flu vaccine, which by the way, not even half the country gets. That's a separate point. But with regard to this, what would you do to protect yourself from the flu? Avoid sick people, wash your hands often, try not to touch surfaces, disinfect areas that may have been contaminated. And then, you know, if we start to see social, uh, we start to see community spreading, then there's, there's this term that, that public health officials use called social distancing distancing yourself from people at that point, staying home maybe from work, keeping the kids from school, uh, looking around your house and saying, look, if we do get into this point for a couple of weeks where we're worried about community spread, do I have enough supplies in the house uh, to, to be okay? Do I have my prescription meds? Do I have kids supplies? Uh, hospitals are gonna need to think about this in terms of surge capacity within hospitals. So all these different things go into place. I, I do wanna give context because all that sounds really scary and I get it, but keep in mind that for the vast majority of people, even if they do get this infection, they will have minimal or no symptoms. 80%, according to some of the largest studies, have minimal or no symptoms. People who are more likely to be, uh, to be really uh, affected by this are people who have pre-existing illnesses, people who are elderly, similar to what we see with flu. Sanjay, is there any way to capture how worried people should be today on a scale of one to 10 from what you've seen in your experience with SARS, H1N1, just, you know, your life as a doctor on a scale of one to 10, how worried should the average American be? Right, right now, I think the, the worry is, is still low. Um, uh, you know, I think there's 57 people in this country uh, who have been uh, conclusively diagnosed with this, uh, this infection. There could be more, again, who don't have any symptoms or have minimal symptoms. Um, but I think you, we got to take what we're hearing from the CDC, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and really make sure that people are acting on that. You hear Dr. Redfield say that, look, this could become something that starts to spread within communities. One person spreads it to three people. Those three people then spread it to three more each and so on. And when you start to get generational spreading like that, it's going to be something that's commonplace. Let me show you H1N1 numbers for a second. You, some of you may remember this. This was back in 2009. I covered this story uh, in, in great detail detail at the time, and it was obviously a, a, a concern, this, this, this strange virus coming out of, out of Mexico at that time. If you look at the numbers now, you find that overall, since H1N1, which was declared a pandemic, you had more than 200 countries, regions, there's 195 countries, and then several regions also affected, tens of millions of people contracted this virus ultimately in the United States alone, and you had tens of thousands of deaths. So, you know, it's, it's, it's of concern. Does this become another pathogen that is circulating around the world like H1N1? That's what we're hearing. Luckily, again, it seems that the vast majority of people will have minimal or no symptoms. But this could be something that we deal with as a world now uh, in, in, the, in the weeks and months going forward.